Wendell Saylor, welcome to the Weekend Briefing. Tom, thanks very much for the invitation. Mate, tell us about the earliest memories for you as a child growing up in Mackay. What comes to mind straight away? Well, I grew up in Serena, which was 30k south of Mackay, but like all my sport was mainly played in Mackay and Serena. So Serena, like it's a little country town, um, mainly known for uh, cane and cattle. Mm. Um, Martin Baller and Dale Shearer. Oh, they were from there. League legends. Yeah, they were. And then Kevin Campion was the next to go. And then I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to go out of there. But also of recent players, Cherry Evans and Ruben Cotter are from there. Wow. Yeah. What's what's in the water or the sugar up there? Yeah, I think <laughs> I think it's just sport time. Like sport was such a big part of our life up there. Um, just you know, country people, and we love rugby league. You know, mm. Queenslanders in general just love rugby league. So when did rugby league get serious for you? Oh, look, it wasn't until about probably 16, 17 sort of schoolboys. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky enough to make a few rep sides and um, I just thought, you know what? Mate, I, I might be all right at this. <laughs> so, Were you always playing out on the wing? Because that was the thing, seeing you, yeah. you know, as a kid uh, on the wing for the Broncos, like, that guy's huge. Mm. You know, he, he must have spent some time in the second row or, you know, a different position on no. the field. Well, I was lucky enough I was playing 5'8", so I used to get the ball. Didn't have much of a passing game, but I was always a bit of a runner. And, and this was shock you. I used to like a bit of the limelight. So <laughs> Still do. Yeah. Well, I, I was I was very lucky where um, I wasn't great at sport. Um, and I was a bit, uh, I, always, I was always a bit out there, a bit extrovert, always mm. a bit excited around people. And so in class, I'd get sent outside a bit for um, for talking too much. And mm. uh, yeah, and, 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 and distracting other people, Tom. Yeah. Fortunately, you now work in radio where that's, that's part of the job, helps you win ratings. Um, tell us about when you found out you were adopted. Can you remember getting the news? Oh, yeah. Look, I think I think in our culture and our family, whether it's, you know, the Torres Strait Islander, Indigenous background, and South Sea Islanders, um, you know, your aunties and your uncles and there's, you know, um, your uncles, you know, could bring up your nephew or your niece and mm. there's a lot of that happening, you know. Um, and for me, when I was at 13 or 14, my adopted mum said to me, you know, your auntie, your auntie Penny, well... It's actually your birth mum. So, right. Yeah. So that's how I found out a little bit. And so um, you were raised by your mum's sister. No, but by just, just uh, a next door neighbour. She was a next oh, door okay. neighbour. So, but she said, not she a was literal auntie, auntie yeah, but like an auntie. Yeah. That's yeah. what in our culture sometimes, yeah. that's what you call, um, you know, your auntie. Yeah. Right. How, how did you feel? At the time, 13, 14, you don't, you don't really put two and two together. But for me, I didn't, I didn't realise. Um, and it wasn't until I got older and then I got a little bit sort of, you know, why did you give me away? Sort of those sort mm, of feelings. Yeah. And like, sometimes I'm a bit of an overthinker. Um, and I wish I didn't overthink it because, um, when I got about 18, I didn't want to do it. didn't want anything to do with my birth mum. Right. What was it like meeting her? Oh, it was fine. Cause I knew she was my auntie. So it was never a problem. But so you, you knew her before you found yeah, out yeah, she was your mum? Yeah, yeah, so my, my, my birth mum, she used to come and visit me as my auntie. That's your only penny. That's your only penny. Yeah. So, um, it, it was just, it was just a different setup in a culture where, I suppose you you want people to tell you the truth, and yeah. then sometimes when you know the truth, um, you can take it either way. You can say, "Oh, thanks for, for telling me that," and make it work, or you do what I didn't probably probably didn't handle it the best way. What do you mean by that? What? Well, how didn't you handle it well? Well, I just I just thought of two days old to give me away to the next door neighbours. I just I just felt that you know why did you have me if you wanted to give me away? Mm. And um, yeah, so I've got some half brothers and sisters that I haven't really had anything to do with, but. You know, I live a very separate life to them. Mm. Um, yeah, and yeah, sometimes you know that plays in, in your head. Um, mm. I, I like I like where I've where I've gotten to in my yeah. life. Um, I'm living the dream. You know, I've always wanted to work in radio and TV, and um, you know, and uh, I, I see myself as an ex football player that was given a great opportunity to do what he did, and um, and I'm loving giving back, whether it's coaching kids, whether it's working uh, in those programs. Um, you know, are you okay, day? A little bit of stuff with Gus for Got You for yeah. Life, but only because I've been there. You know. Yeah, and so I've heard you tell a story about getting kicked out of a party yeah, um, because you were black. Yeah, yeah. Take us to that moment. You know, you're 13 years old at that point. How did that make you feel in a community that I imagine was mostly a white community? Yeah, it it was. The community itself, it was just part and parcel of that community because there was a lot of um, South Sea Islanders, Indigenous people, um, you know, um, in that Mackay Serena area. And it, it was a bit of to and from. It was the reverse racism as well. So it was a bit of to and from, you know. And I, mate, mum and dad, we, I didn't see colour when I was growing up. Mm. I just, I loved everybody, you know. I, I wanted to be everyone's friend. And um, I remember that day we, we played a game in Mackay. And I'd been lucky enough, I was, I was the captain of the team. Mm. 
So, you know, I love being front and centre and then... You're going to be invited to the party. Yeah, <laughs> so, and all those people were my friends and I, I still hang out with a couple of those people now from um, from back home, you know. Um, a couple of the girls and one of the girls just recently said, oh, I can't believe that happened. Like, we never knew. But to cut to the story, you're in this party full of your mates yeah. and the girl who's hosting her father calls you out? Yeah, so we were, it's, so grade seven, grade eight. So there's about like 25 of us at a party and we're having a good time and the dad walks in and just looks at me. And just points and says, what's the darky doing here? Mm. And then the brother comes over and says, he's got to go. So um, I had to ring my mum, you know, old school, mm. like five double six, yeah. you know, and then, you know, <laughs> and just said, oh, mum, I'm feeling sick. So I had to make an excuse to leave the party because I didn't want to tell mum and dad. Yeah. Because I didn't want to blow it out of proportion. But, um, yeah. If you told them the real reason, how do you think they would have reacted to yeah, that? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I think a lot of us, um, you don't want to put your mum and dad in a situation where, they would fight that battle because your mum and dad has been through those battles, you know? Yeah. But here we are still in 2024 and we're still fighting the same battles. And so what was the background of your adopted parents? Um, so I think, I think my dad was West Indian and mum was South Sea Island Indigenous. Your birth parents? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so okay. I, I never met my birth dad. So I, I, to this day, I, I don't know who my birth dad is. So mm. that's why that West Indian background in, in my culture, as in me, so I've ne I've never found out. Um, I think my kids have tried to find out on gum, um, you know, on the um, the tree thing. What do you call yeah. it? Uh, uh, I've forgotten the name. Yeah, yeah I've forgotten yeah. the name too. But yeah, the family tree. Oh, I, yeah. but I don't want to know. Like, I only knew one dad. And the dad that brought me up was a Torres Strait Islander, uh, Daniel Sailor. And to go up your adopted the, yeah, father. Yeah, yeah, to go up to the Torres Strait Islands to to go back to Thursday Island, and and, and our family is all over Australia. So they went mm. to Perth to work in the mines. My dad worked on the railway for twenty seven years. This is the sailor. Clan. Yeah, the sailor, yeah. sailor clan. Yeah. And then obviously, um, yeah. So for me, uh, it's something that I've never found out. I never really wanted to, um, mm. but my kids more so than me. Right. So you identify with your adoptive father's yes. Torres Strait Islander heritage, yes. um, but your DNA comes from the Caribbean and, it, yeah. and Solomon Islands. Yeah. But also I think indigenous as well. So yeah. um, I've got a certificate there. So people sometimes go, oh, you know, he's not of that background. Um, you know, he's, you know, he's this, but like, I've got a, you know, I've got a certificate there that says, you know, what, what I am. And, and that's, that's how I've grown up. Mm. So story about a racist dad in Mackay in the eighties probably doesn't surprise people. No, no, of course not. It wasn't just in Mackay. It was like all through like North Queensland, far North Queensland, central Queensland, you know, it was one of those things where it was part of the, the culture and part of what we seen and. And I and I and I, I I used it. I used it to try and change um, the way people think. And I still do a lot of those indigenous community things now, or, or you know, the, mm. even grassroots. Because I, I I got bullied a bit too through school because of the color of my skin. Yeah. So you say it fueled you, and you used it sort of um, to to drive you. Um, did it did it hurt you in ways as well? And did of it course. did it hold you back? Didn't hold me back, but like just yeah. uh, I used it in a few where. I use it as motivation and sometimes that can be good um, and sometimes it can be bad because you can use it the wrong way as mm. well. As we touched on there, no one will be surprised about that story from, you know, North Queensland in the 80s, but there's still racism and, and racist taunts coming out in, in and around rugby league today, you know, probably the whole of Australian society, but rugby league as well, which is your patch. Yeah. Um, we've just seen this incident at the, the Las Vegas season opener. Um, where one player, Ezra Mam, racially slurred mm. by another player of Polynesian background. What do you make of this one? Look, there's no winners in this, you know. Um, you know, Ezra probably he got quite upset. And Ezra, for me, I've known Ezra for a couple of years now. Mm. He's a beautiful young kid. Uh, and I see him like a son because uh, my son and his son are pretty good friends. Tristan Saylor, obviously, they, they were good at South Slogan. Mm. And Tristan, last couple of years, Ezra's been really good at helping Tristan get there. It's him and Reese Walsh, you know, they're mm. all really good right. kids. Yeah. Um, and Spencer, like, you know, just for me, I've enjoyed watching Spencer play the last couple of years, you know, he's a right. three-time premiership player, you know, he's one of those big alpha forwards that you like watching in the game. So you care about both of them? Oh, care, of course I care about both of them, um, you know, and I just know that Spencer, you know, if he's proven guilty here, he's probably going to spend a bit of time on the sidelines because you've got some of the greats, you know, talking about this because we've all been through it, you know. Um, and, and, and if he said it in the heat of the moment, look, I think you own the situation, you apologise. Because the NRL can't do any more, okay? Mm. But this is big for them now because there's a lot of spotlight on the NRL. Um, also, uh, the clubs. I know I've been at the Dragons. I've been at the Broncos. Mm. Um, I see clubs. The education is there. But 
we know it's human nature to make mistakes and say things under pressure, you know? I, so human nature, that's an interesting yeah. um, way to describe it. Why, why is this in people's nature? And, you know, I think we all would have thought it would have stopped by now. It might have died out in the 80s and 90s. Why does it still happen? Tom, how, how are we going to stop it? When you've got it happening in the Premier League, you know, you've got it happening in the NFL, you've got it happening in the NBA. It's 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 human nature. Like this has been around for hundreds of years, you know, um, different colour people, you know, the American Indians. It's just, you know, you go to New Zealand, same sort of thing. But the New, Ze- the New Zealand, the Kiwis, they, they seem to come together, you mm. know. Look at Australia Day for us, you know. We, mm. we can't even celebrate Australia Day. It's Invasion Day. I know me as an Australian, and we'll get to that at mm. some stage, you know, I, I love being Australian. When mm. I, whenever I wore the Kangaroos jersey, wore the Wallabies yeah. jersey, I was so proud to be Australian, yeah. you know. And people now, I, I feel like I can't celebrate on Australia Day because people will say Invasion Day, change your date. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but we, it, I don't know if we're getting better. It just, you know, but also the power of social media too now, it's, I think it's the jump on effect, you know. Mm. So you don't know if we're getting better. That's an interesting yeah. thing. I think that's what I think infuriating about this, not just the damage that it causes and the hurt, it's the, it's the disappointment that it still happens. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think goes on in those moments? You said there a phrase that was interesting as well, in the heat of the moment. Mm. So is it about one person trying to put down another person and reaching for the the most hurtful thing they can oh, find or so. what's going on in those moments. Can oh, you break it down for me? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. When you watch rugby league or you're playing rugby league for me, so in that heat of the battle, there's things that are said on the field that back in my day in, in the nineties and that in two thousands, it stays in the field. You shake hands and you walk off. Mm. Now, But those things, what's the, what's the objective of them? It's to it, get in their head 100% to it hurt is. them. Yes. Whatever yes. you can grasp yeah. at. And, yes. Yes. That's exactly right. And some people will just, Take it and wear it, and 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 then walk away, and then and then you shake hands after the field. I'll give you one incident incident in, in my career, like not so much about my racism, mm. but Ian Roberts. Okay, mm-hmm. so in nineteen ninety seven, okay, and Gordon Teller saved my life this day. Okay, okay, okay. There's two players that I was probably scared of when I played footy. I don't wasn't scared of anyone because yeah, I'm a bit like <laughs> left to centre. Probably Les Davidson, okay, and Ian Roberts, like two of the toughest forwards you could play, and you yep. just they both can box. Anyway, so the night before we played the Cowboys in um, up in Townsville, I got a call from my wife and said, um, "You just lost your mate, Chris Felmingham. He just he went through he went through the window, um, no seatbelt on, um, and, he, and he died instantly." So I found that out the night before. And the next day, I played against the Cowboys. Shouldn't have played. I wasn't in a great headspace. Mm. Wayne told me not to play, so I went in the, went in the field and I I was a lunatic. I was just pushing people around. I was just bullying people. Trying and, to start fights? Yeah, I was, but I was just angry. I was angry. Like, I lost my best mate. Like, he's 22, 23. Mm. He's got an 18-month-old daughter, and I just played angry, you know? Mm. And then up in towns where I played a lot of footy, a lot of family members. I think mum and dad were in the crowd that night, too. Anyway, so as as I played the ball, two players had tackled me from the Cowboys, and I just went bang and just reached out. And as I hit this bloke in the face, I looked up. It was Ian Roberts. <laughs> and I, and I, saw my li- I saw my life... <laughs> Just flash, <laughs> and I was lucky because he gets up and he just he goes, "You want to go, Dell?" And Gordon Teller steps in the middle, and and then I sort of stood there because I thought I can't take a backward step, mm-hmm. but I know he would have punched holes in me. Mm-hmm. And Gordy goes, "Rob, because even Gordy said, Gordy goes, mate, I was scared, I was scared too, because <laughs> that's and and everyone thought I called him a homophobic name, but there's no way that I would say that. Mm-hmm. I wasn't raised that way, but this is where perception sometimes. So all the crowd started booing me, and this is where we'll digress. Um, all the crowd started booing me thinking that, because I don't forget, Ian Roberts came out, I just think, you know, just before that to talk about him being gay. And mm. You think about being a footballer and you know, coming out, being one of the toughest footballers in the, in the yeah. game and talk about being gay. And then through the game, every time I ran the ball, he chased me. I, I'd look on the corner of my eye and he'd fly to the top <laughs> of me and try and get me. But as we walked off, I, I walked up to him and I apologised and he said, no, no problems, Del, we'll leave it here. I, I didn't say that. Mm. He knew I didn't say that, but it's because I punched him in the face or I hit him there. Mm. And mate, that, him being a tough man. But people assume that you'd yes, you'd, you'd given him a homophobic slur. Yes, yes, that's right. why because he chased me all day of the field. But did that become a thing after the game? No, that, no, no, it that, didn't. Everyone right. was good, but no, everyone was good. But I'm just saying that's the perception sometimes of what happened. But this, I know this one's a bit different. But where I'm going is I've had my own little stuff in the field where I walked up and apologised and, and owned yeah. that situation. But there was a lot of things that were happening. So you you talk about why this happens that someone's trying to dominate someone on the field yeah. and they 
for some reason they reach for a, a racist or a homophobic sure. slur on the football field. But there's there's many ways on on the field you can get in someone's face yeah. and, and make them feel like shit without yeah. slagging off their race, yeah. their sexuality. Yep. So why do some people or some fans yeah. why do they reach for the, one of those into those dark pockets to hurt someone and not some other way? There's many ways you can trash I, someone I, on the field. I know because they're not smart enough to think of some other sledge or the, or, or the gamesmanship of it. You know, like. Um, that's just, mate, and they're so used to... And because, so it's stupidity or weakness or... A bit, a bit of both, but also it's it's just, they're not thinking too much. They're just they're just thinking this is an easy sledge to do. So even when I, like, when I sledged, you, you try and think of a, a good sledge rather What were than, some of your greatest hits? I'm uh, just like, but I, I would try and make people angry. Yeah. Like, I remember playing Jason Rolls one time and Wayne said to me, he goes, I want you to, Jason Rolls, mate, really good young forward in the game, obviously, you know, pretty fair coach. And Wayne said, I need you to go after Jason Rolls today. So when I t- took a hit up from the wing, I did 20 hit ups and I did two tackles, you know, because of the mm. winger. So then when I ran at him, I just go, mate, I can't believe you're playing against me today. You'll be in reserve grade by the time I finish you, <laughs> uh, finish with you today. And then he kept getting angry. Yeah. He kept getting like, wild. So you come and tri- try and shoot but at that's a bit of fun. Bit of fun, but you got to be smart. And then, like, mate, we're good mates now, Jason Rolls. And I, but you got to be smart with it. All like when I played Dan and Kemp, like I, he looked at me, and Dan and Kemp was so quick. Mm. And uh, I, I, I knew that if he got on the outside of me, he'd burn me because I think he ran about a ten, nine, or eleven seconds. And mm. when I was a bit older at the Dragons, I was a bit, you know, bit, bit more, bit more voluptuous. You know, mm. wasn't as quick. <laughs> and um, you had a few years out of the game. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did, I did. And then when when I looked over at him and he started smiling at me, and I just sort of went, "What are you smiling at?" So, "What are you smiling at?" And then he and then he looked away, and then I said, "If you, you run at me, I'll throw you into the back of that grandstand." And then and then we become mates after that. He goes, "Classic banter." Yes, but but the the race card or the homophobia. Yeah. Um, you're sort of saying, in some cases at least, on the field between players, yeah. it's a a lazy or a stupid way of it's trying a, to get in someone's head. But don't don't you think in some cases it, it actually might go to something deeper that there's an underlying attitude that is is really dangerous about one race being lower than another and that's and that's where we're getting it and that's why some do it some people it's you know that's a priority which you know sometimes when players do that that's what they're trying to do mm. you know and I, I i do like that the boys the bronco boys got around ezra mammy because he's a young halfback you know if, if me and gordon tell us we're in the team and something happened like that to steve Randolph or one of our young indigenous players you know a justin hodges or something or a load of Kiri, mate me and gordon tell us be the first two guys there so race relations in rugby league is pretty interesting because it's a real melting pot. Yeah, there's it a is. huge number of Indigenous and Polynesian players yeah, in the yeah, game. Yeah, it is. Um, twelve and a half, twelve and a half to fourteen percent Indigenous players, mm. and I think it's fifty to fifty-five percent um, Polynesian players. You know, and don't forget, we just had the All Stars last month. You know, like how good was that? Mm. And then we're looking at this now, and like. You know, it's going to happen. I know there's a, there's a nice, healthy respect between the Indigenous players and the Polynesian boys because, you know. And Not this in this is, case, apparently. Yeah, but I, once again, I think Spencer, you know, he's going to regret this, like, you know, when, when yeah. it comes down to it because I think Spence is better than this. And, I, I, you know, I love when he went at Jad Rear Hargraves, you know, because he knew Jad, Jad's been the alpha for a long time and now he's there. So, you know, a lot of people are going to have their say in this. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where the NRL now, um, they got to draw a line in the sand because you know they they they're, they're big, big on the say, saying no to racism and stuff. Mm. So let's move along in your story. You do nine seasons with the Broncos before getting a, an offer to go to rugby union. Mm. Basically, double the money. Yeah, it was double the money. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, Gordon Tallis tells the story where when he won the World Cup in two thousand, and Gordon said, "Now we can stay together, and you know we can we can have mate make it um you know have a great legacy here." So you you know? had a few Broncos playing for the Australian team, so well, you're banding together. It was Lockyer, Webkey, Tallis, and myself. Not mate. a bad foursome. Not a bad foursome, <laughs> you know. Um, and we were we were all around. This, you know, Lockie was a little bit younger than us. Yeah. But me, Gordy, and uh, we're the same age. And, and Lockie, obviously, you know what Lockie's done in his career. Yeah. He, he's done all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the best. So you're all banding together, going, let's stick it out. But then, and you actually get a call from Wayne Bennett during a big night out, and you agree to a deal in principle. But then. Another offer comes no, we'll, on the we'll, table. Well, Gordy wanted to call Wayne to say, "Mate, look, come on, Dell, we, we'll get you a good deal." And the state said, "Yeah, yeah." And, and you know, well, obviously, we're day two after we won the World Cup in two thousand. <laughs> and uh, it's okay. like Mad Tuesday by now. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. <laughs> that's what it was like. And um, take the, uh, Wayne takes a call and he goes, "You know, we'll put something together." And then by the time I get back home, 
So this is how deals happen, by the way. Sometimes, no sometimes that deals are done a lot with the Broncos and that. You've got one player barracking for another yeah. player, bring him on, give him a decent deal. Yeah, and look, because Gordy, you know, Gordy had sat out a year too, you know, you know and um, not long before that. Anyway, so we, I said, yeah, but then by the time I've sort of got home, um, Eddie Jones had called my management and wanted to have a meeting with me. So mm. Eddie Jones, mm. so Eddie Jones just like you know wanted me to come to rugby and then. Um, I met with rugby because it was in my best interest to meet with rugby. Mm. And then at this time too, I knew there was two young kids, Justin Hodges mm. and Lottie Dakiri coming through the grade. So, mm. um, I wasn't trying to be selfish, but yep. I'm just, you know, and there was a guy called Jonah Lomu. So, so many things in my head, which, you know, <laughs> when you're an overthinker like me, um, it can be good and bad. It's a big opportunity. So this is 2001 that you, you make the big switch, um, you know, and me as a country rugby union kid who also had one eye on rugby league. I'd seen you come through with the Broncos, obviously a standout player and a standout character. And then you could step into our game, which was amazing. Uh, and it was a good time for rugby union, almost won the world cup in 2004. Yeah, Johnny Wilkinson. I, oh. I still, I still get PTSD from that. Like just the switch kick, mate. Like he deserved it. Like you got to go a bit left to center to win those big matches. And then England haven't won a world cup since, you know? Yeah. And I was in a pub full of um, Brits down in Cape Town watching oh, that match. Cape Town's not a bad place. Yeah, it was, it was a good mm. place to be watching it. I We really enjoyed being in the pub for the semi-final, but yeah. not, not the final yeah, we so smashed much. your blacks, didn't we? Yeah. Then we get... I want to go to yeah. one of the most controversial parts mm. of your story is you're sort of... You're doing well in rugby union. You're having a good time. You've obviously gone past, I think, the first deal. You may be into your second deal by the stage. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah so, so, so I had four years... Yeah, I had a four-year deal. And then um, Western Force came in and then they were offering players deals. So Nathan Sharp and all these guys and, you know, Drew Mitchell, they were all looking at other options and that. So um, Lottie, Lottie the Kiri calls me and he goes, and Matty Rogers goes, mate, come to the World Tars. So for a Queenslander who's born and bred Queensland, grown mm. up always Queensland, always in New South Wales, for me to look at that option to come to Sydney, there's two reasons I came, looked at it. One, um, to play in the 2007 World Cup, uh, but also... The World Tars had a pretty good squad then, but also the Sydney market. Um, and this will shock you. I used to like the bright lights, you know? <laughs> and I used to like, so, so Lottie would go, mate, come down here, mate, you know, for your brand, and that'd be great. And I, I thought about it in my management, because it was the same money. It wasn't more money. It wasn't more money from the Reds at the Were Reds. Were you also offered. thinking coming into Sydney and becoming more well-known, building the profile yeah. would be good for post-football career? Yeah, well, that's that's what my management at the time said. Like, he goes, mate, for your profile, like, and what you've done, Sydney's a place you got to be, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously I had deals with Fox and Channel 9 at the time too, yeah. so it just made sense. Um, okay. and, and and also with Fox with Super Rugby, you know, I did a lot of those commercials, the Bundaberg Rum ads. <laughs> Mate, some of the best ads I've done, I don't know where they've gone now, was with the Bundy Bear. Mate, they were so good. They were so good. Remember yeah. Jeremy Paul and that? And I think Bill Young and all these guys yeah. and George Gregg. And they were they were the good times of the, Mate, you of weren't all the this. You weren't going to the fridge during the ad breaks when the Bundy Rum ads were, 100%. were, were rolling. Yeah. Okay, so you've alluded to a few times that you like to night out, and, and many of us do. Um, I do too. It brought you unstuck. You got busted for cocaine in mm. 2006, which basically brought your rugby career to it an did, end. It did, yeah. Two years out. Yeah. Now, you, you've owned it pretty well. Mm. A lot of people, and this is a funny thing, watching rugby league players or rugby union players sure. get into trouble. A lot of time, if it involves illicit drugs, the story is, I was struggling with my mental health or yeah. going through a tough time. That's why I turned to drugs. But I think in some cases that might be true, but often it's a lie. Yeah, the person what was actually just wanting to have a good time. Well, that's look. That look, I, I partied on a Wednesday night, and then I got tested on a Sunday, and they found a metabolite in my system. Um, the doctors around then said if I would have drunk a liter of water, would have been out of my system. I wasn't mm. big on water, so I, I used to love my soft drink, and then I, I used to love um, um, caffeine. You know, because yeah. when you're sp supposed an extrovert, like you just you want your sleep and you get up and you're ready to go. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, so for me, there was things that happened at the time wasn't ideal. But can I tell you, I think it was the making of me because um, I just think those two years I had to go back and- What did uh, you do? Um, I did a lot of things. I did Dancing with the Stars. I did community programs. Um, you know, I, I got uh, I got some counselling just because of what happened in my childhood and growing up. So there was a few um, there was a few things that I had to deal with, you know? So tell me about the counselling. Did 
did what you had to go through growing up, being adopted and, and not knowing the real story about why your mother yeah. left you out, did that have anything to do with the drugs or was that just something you, nah, was, you got to deal with now that you had the time to yeah, actually... Yeah, that, that was just a byproduct of something uh, that I got to deal with because of having time out to actually, for the first time, not having to play a role, you know. So I was lucky because when I was 18, 19, coming straight into grade, playing for the Broncos, mate, I'm playing outside Steve Runoff and Alan Langer and uh, Kevin Walters, you know, yeah. and how good's this? I'm playing against Manly, you know, Manly, Manly were my team as a kid yeah. uh, growing up because of Dale Shearer and Martin Bella. So... So you're not going to be going, hey, hey, Steve Renouf, hey, Alan Langer, I've got to go to counselling. Yeah, <laughs> you're like oh, you're just yeah. busy getting into it. I know, but I think I think you got to hit rock bottom sometimes to find yourself again. Mm. And uh, you know, I had at that time, you know, I had obviously three kids, and then obviously Tara and I had two kids, Tristan, who's obviously playing uh, in the, with the Broncos now, and then I had a daughter. So it was. I actually helped coach his team. Clove Valley Crocs were really good right. with me. So going down there and helping when Tristan debuted, Tristan's actually, to, to be honest, Tristan's actually a New South Wales one because mm. he played his first game in New South Wales. Yeah. Um, and you know who was in that team with him? Uh, Clove Valley Crocs for a couple of years? Who? Uh, Lachlan Lamb and Victor Radley. Right, okay. So those three, they, they used to terrorize sides. But, but me going back down there, spending time with my son and obviously even my daughter, taking them to school and that, Gave me an appreciation for like, okay, that was my career, but you know what? I need to come back and finish on my terms. Yeah. Well, it gave you a snapshot into the rest of your life, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. And but you can ask any question because I mean, for me, nothing's off limits there. So the, the drug suspension, it doesn't like, you know, it doesn't define me. Like mm. I see plants who have been done for steroids in like 22 weeks. I saw Bronson Cherry last year and I said, I said, good luck to you, mate. I said, mate, you've done your time. When you come back. Mate, who cares what people think? It's how, you know, he, mate, that young man, like, he, he got a four year suspension, mm. you know, and you made choices, but you know what? He, he owned those choices, and, and I'm happy to see him back. So let's go to the, the mistake you made. One thing I've always sort of thought watching rugby league or union players come unstuck in this way is I get it, you want to party. Mm. Partying's fun, yeah. especially in your 20s. Mm. But you've got so much riding on it. You know, you, you mm. were getting paid seven or 800 grand at a year mm. at Australian Rugby Union in the Waratahs. Yeah. Why can't people in that situation just wait till their playing days are over? You get such a short window to be at the top of your game, you know, five, 10, 15 yeah. years at the most. So what, what, what happens? Why, why does that mistake get made? Because you, you're getting, because you're watching everyone else have a good time. You, you're hanging with sponsors who are A-listers, and you, you walk in rooms with celebrities, and you're going, "How good's this?" And you, mm. and then you want a part of it. So part of you thinks, "Okay, you know what? Uh, there's that threshold. There you go. Okay, you either make a, a disciplined decision not to, or then you go, you know what? I want to be a part of it. So you start to sort of think, "Okay, you know what? Just once or twice, this will be okay. okay." And that's when I got to Sydney. Mm. Like, I was the worst thing I was doing probably. Was after games and that we're, we're going really well uh, on a Sunday. You go to VCs, yep. then you go to King's Cross. Nice. Like King's Cross was like it was all time. So, yeah. uh, and for someone with my personality, um, I can be disciplined when you have to be disciplined. Mm. Okay, but like uh, Sydney was just exciting. Like yeah. through that Waratahs, even like even to this day, I still feel guilty. I go to the uh, Waratahs Old Boys, uh, that, and I still feel guilty in two thousand and six because I think I think I think it cost us a title. We had we had mm. a young Curtly Beal mm. coming from Joey's. Mm. Throwing double cutout passes, mm. drop offs, and I said to Lottie, "Mate, this kid Curtly Beal, yeah. like we had Sean Byrne at the time and Tim Donnelly, and uh, I, I know Tim Donnelly. Yeah, yeah. Tim, mate, 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 no, those boys are good. Yeah. And then you got Curtly Beal, who's in grade ten or grade eleven, training with us. And can I tell you, like, I don't know, Curtly's went through his own adversity yeah. and he's through it now. But um, and I always still 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 stay in touch with Curtly. But mate, like, that's that's where we were in the two thousand and sixes and sevens. You know, yeah, it was an amazing time. So. It's just too exciting. You just it's just a temptation to have fun when you when you're at that level. And yeah, you know, I, you've talked about yeah. walking into parties with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and yeah. people like that. That's the world that was on offer to you. Yeah, it was. You know, you go to King's Cross and then you know you got the A list. So you, you've just as an athlete, you, you've got to realise that you're an athlete. You're not an A lister, mm. even though if you look at it now, like you know, look at Nathan Cleary, like you know, look at um, Reese Walsh, like me and Darren Lockyer. Uh, we did the Kier ad uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. We mm. recorded, yeah, and yeah. we had this conversation about Reese Walsh, like. Look, Reese Walsh has won nothing and he's played two two origins and he's killed it. And Lockie says to me, this is Darren Lockie saying to me, I said, mate, what about Reese Walsh? He goes, mate, he could be the first player to, to make two million two million dollars. And that's not even winning a premiership. Is he disciplined? Well, I don't know. But like that's this is gonna be my son reckons he because he's got his daughter, Tristan, and Tristan's pretty good. Like he, he said, Daddy goes, he just loves his daughter and but but there's that excitement now, you know, like when you see him rock in, like 
I know those Bronco boys got a bit of a swagger, but mate, Wayne Bennett was our coach. He let us swagger. So if, if you're going to swagger, you got to you got to aim up. But we had some old school hard nuts, you know. We had like Glenn Lazarus, you know, Gordy. You know, you know mm. Gordy. Gordy could swagger with the best of them, you know. I, I love Gordy. Gordy's one of those guys. If you want to go to a gunfight, mate, you want Gordon Tellis on your side, you know. <laughs> he was a- pretty solid. Tell me about the good times. I mean, what was so fun about it? You've given us a bit of a snapshot there, the kind of people you're meeting. What is it What is it doing for who you are, your sense of self? Like, what's it like to be at the top of your game and, and having that kind of fun and that kind of access? Well, look, I, I feel sorry for the players these days because I say to Joey and first on all these guys, like, mate, if the phone's around back in our day. Like, you think about it. Oh, yeah. Freddie Fittler, you know, Joey Johns, myself, Mark Geyer, Brian Fletcher, Hindy, all these guys, we came through an era and we sit on the panels and we have to talk about the current game. We, we don't throw stones in that, but it's hard for these young kids now when everyone's got a phone. Um, I'll tell you how good those times were. So the Broncos, if we win a game and just say you'd be at a pub, so Hotel LA or the Regatta or somewhere or, or the City Rowers, it might be at four o'clock, oh, mate, we're going to shut. Okay, boys. But you guys can stay till six, six, seven in the morning. Okay. And, you know, um, yeah, free drinks. Mate, the boss said, you guys are sweet. So we'd yeah. have lock-ins. Yeah. So, you know, we asked them, could be some of our friends yeah. there. And the, the recovery wasn't big back in those days. We might have a recovery session. Okay, but hang on. So we're, we're having a, a lock-in at four. That's going till six. What's happening at six? Where are we going after that? Well, it depends if you want to go to someone's place or you just call it quits. But because we've had a big day, we finished at 10 or 11. Wasn't any of these late night footy games, you know? So mm. you, could, you could get out by 10, 30, 11. And mate, it's just like you get drink cards. Yeah, mate, I've uh, you know at City Rolls, there's a thousand dollar drink card for you. My mates from the country would it's go a drink card. Yeah, for the first three years of Broncos, I didn't drink, mate. That's what I mean. Right. From eighteen to twenty one, I didn't drink. So, um, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it, it's sometimes it's better the devil you know. Like, mm. and I, I was never big on drinking because I'd seen not just with our culture, but up in North Queensland, I'd seen a lot of things in and around pubs and stuff. You know, my dad wasn't a big drinker and neither was my mum, you know, but I had uncles and like some of my uncles were all the big, you know, they, they worked in the mines or they, well, they worked as... Um, Good drunks, bad drunks. Can be a bit of both, a bit of both, you know. You'd see them change mm. and I didn't want to be that guy, but, you know, um, you know, some of my uh, aunties and my cousins and all that, you know, I've, you know, I've got a few, If you know, it's funny, when I was in North Queensland playing Foley's Field Football, I'd go up there as a 17-year-old and people would go, oh, mate, oh, yeah, I, I know your cousin. I was in jail with your cousin at Stuart Prison or somewhere. Oh. So, yeah. So you've talked a bit about your son, Tristan. You've yeah. got two other kids. Yeah. And we've talked about one of your big mistakes. Mm. What What do you like as a father? <sighs> Look, I think I could always be better as a father. Um, you know, sometimes I think through my life I've been a bit selfish. It's been about me. Like, you know, I think one of the, one of the kids taught me sometimes is, you know, when I've been like, you know, I might have done a commercial for like, say, Stray Day Ad, or I might have been away doing an Origin and I come back and, you know, I'm, I'm mucking around saying, oh, the big deal, you know, because I, I like the third person yeah. talk. Because Wayne, <laughs> Wayne Bennett, Wayne Bennett reckons he, he just, he just, he said he's never met anyone like me. He, he goes, uh, I mean, it's, it's a funny story I'll tell you later, but um, yeah, and then I'd come home and then, you know. So you come back, you come back, you're jacked up, you've yeah, had a good time. Yeah, I'm full of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just like, I'm a lock of self, I'm just uh, sweating. Yeah. And then my daughter said to me one day, too, it's good to have a daughter, she goes, Dad. We don't care if you're the big deal. We just want dad at home. So what does that mean? Just like they don't need all the bells and whistles. They don't need the sort of the, the, the showman, the showman. And I've always been a showman um, mm. because I think sometimes, I mate, mean, someone said to me, sometimes you play a part when you're playing footy. Like mm. when people meet me, like people go, mate, look, you know, you're, you're different to what I thought you'd be like, but no one knows how hard my upbringing was because mum mm. and dad, we didn't have much money, okay? Mm. Um, when I was 14, mum had to go and get a food stamp uh, for 200 bucks from the St. Vincent's wow. de Paul in in in, um, in Serena, which, you know, it's quite embarrassing just because our family helped each other out mm. and stuff and just to see my mum upset. And then, you know, one night the, the washing machine broke down and, she, and then she was downstairs and she was washing, she was hand washing at like 10 o'clock at night and I stayed down there to guard my mum like I was such a mummy's boy and mm. I just... I just, some things around that, I just thought when I got older, I was going to make it and not let people bring me down and affect me. So that's when, when I did get suspended, mm. you know, I felt like I let her down because, um, because my dad had passed away in 2001 mm. and that was hard for me too, because he passed away just before I went to union. So my dad never really got to see me play for the Wallabies, mm. but I thought he did all the hard work, but yeah. yeah, but I just think me as a dad, like. So when your daughter says, we just, we just want you, that's about attention, connection. Yeah. Yeah, Drowning look, I, out the noise. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, just concentrating on them and, and and doing something for them rather than, so sometimes there'd be a family barbecue on and I'd go, look, nah, I'm too tired because I'd been, maybe I'd been to Cairns to, to mm. you know, to 
out back somewhere because I, I always do the community stuff because when I was suspended for two years, whether it's Moree, whether it's Cairns, whether it's Townsville, mm. I, I came back and I didn't say this to you before, Arthur Beats and Adrian Miles were two of the blokes that helped me get back. Mm. Tom Radonikus. Mm. They said, we know you're a decent bloke. Yeah, back to St. St. George. and Yeah, but that's, that's again, why yeah. I came back and just thought, you know, I've got to, I've got to finish on my terms. And that's what Arthur Beetson instilled in me. Because Arthur Beetson, he selected me in that first Queensland team in uh, 1996. Mm. We lost 3-0 to New South Wales, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> okay. So your daughter's saying, we just, we just want you at home. We know you're excited, Dad. Yeah. We know you're a bit of a character. We yeah. know you talk about yourself in the third person. Yeah. yeah. Um, but... What does that connection time look like? How do you how do oh, you give your children what what they want? Oh, wait, 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 I'm 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 a good dad when I'm on. Like, like, mm. yeah, you know, we'll go to the park. We'll, we'll go and do something fun. We'll go to the movies. Yeah. Like, you know, if there was something on, um, you know, Charlotte Dawson, who was a really good friend of mine. Yeah. My daughter liked that. You know, uh, next top model. So she yeah. said, Dad, can we go to that? So it's not the not the big famous things they want, but yeah. I knew she wanted to go. So I rung Charlotte on short notice, and you know, she got me, my daughter, and um, yeah. my wife, and my son. My son didn't mind. Tristan didn't mind at the time. <laughs> But then, you know, and then don't forget, you know, I lose Charlotte not, not long after yeah. that. Um, so I lost, I've lost probably five or six people to suicide as well. Wow. So that makes me, instills in me, like, I've got to tell my story and be better. And not, not everyone's got to like my story, you know? Yeah. And I don't need anyone's sympathy, but mate, I've gone through the darkness to see the light. And, and, and I'm hopefully, hopefully my story helps educate the next generation, um, we're all going to make mistakes. It's human nature to make mistakes. Yeah. So what do you think? What do you, what do you think is the main lesson from your story and what you've been through? And how do you think that helps other people deal with their own mental health struggles? Just just be honest. Just surround yourself with the right people. Not everyone's got your best interests at heart, mate. When times are good, people want to jump on board. Okay. Yeah. And let me tell you, when it gets bad, you see who jumps off jumps off that uh, that bandwagon. You know. Mm. Um, I know Gus and Jude always give me give me a little bit of stick about jumping on different bandwagons, but <laughs> I just love being positive. I love people. There's so much mm. negativity in the world today. Yeah. You know, um, and I know I did the Mardi Gras fight um, with the NRL a few years back and mm. mates of mine are going, oh, mate, oh, I didn't know that you, mate, you should have come out of the closet and that. But that's, <laughs> that's you know, you can have, but that's the mindset sometimes that people don't want to be who they want to be. Yeah. And our next generation of kids, mate, they're going to do it tougher than anyone now, you know, because they've got to make choices on who they are, you know, whether they're gay, whether they're whatever, doesn't matter. I don't get into it too much, mm. but but I'm not judging anyone. Yeah. So being honest and open about who you are, yeah. is that the Wendell Saylor lesson? Oh, yeah, I think so. Especially yeah. now in 2024, I think for me, it's taken me three years to get back here after losing my mum. I, I think, um, you know, my mum, she died at the start of COVID. Like she died mm. in a home by herself. So when wow. I walked out of Triple M here, I got a call because I know she had two mild heart attacks. And as I walked out, it's Melbourne Storm game. Um, and I walked out on a Sunday and my niece calls me and she goes, she goes, we've lost mum. And then I just started crying, walking past Georgia Boys Cafe, mm. driving, having to drive home to Wollongong and realised my mum was gone. Mm. Then I had to do two weeks in quarantine. It took me three weeks to bury my mum, you know. And then I lost a mate to cancer um, who was a manager, Tony Connolly. Mm. And then obviously Tristan gets charged. Uh, obviously got found not guilty. Mm. But that was my first couple of months at the start of COVID. Wow. So it's taken me probably three years to get back to being who I want to be. Uh, three years and a bit. So you lost that positivity that people know you for during that time? Well, yeah. Well, not just, yeah, it was. I, I, and my escapism was, I just didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to be in a room full of people. Like people would ask me about my son. They'd go, oh, mate, what about young bloke? Oh, mate, even if he gets found not guilty, you know, he's always going to so be. So for people listening who don't know, his son was charged with, Trist Tristan was charged with sexual assault, but yeah. that, was, that was thrown out. It was thrown out was yeah. within 40 minutes, but it was two and a half years out of our lives. So we had to. To, to take that battle and I and I had people around me I had a lot of good people around me like you know Triple M were great but a lot of mates special forces Mick Bainbridge you know Commando there was you know guys Marty Downs there's a lot of good people you know a lot of all my Bronco mm. teammates got around me and Alan Langer rang me and he said mate you know he said mate we got you here you know so but just to watch your kids go through that that was for me that was the hardest me personally mm. um, is that the hardest uh, thing since 2006 oh, yeah I think so that that the two year suspension, mate, that was that was easy because, mate, I'd had a couple of warnings like when I was at the Wallabies and yeah. me and Lottie and a few of the boys would be going out middle of the week and that for drinking, but nothing, you know. But like just seeing your kids go through that and, and just knowing the whole time he was innocent and what he had to go through, just the media pressure on it. I know the media we got a job to do. Mm. 
And just to watch him come through it now. So even this year with Triple M, I've cut back on my calling uh, to, to what, go and watch him play a bit more and spend a bit more time with my daughter. He probably got extra focus because his dad was famous. That's and that's and that's the pressure that that people actually said to me. I've got mates who are police officers going, mate. It's only because he's your son, and and I didn't feel guilty. That hard for you to watch? Yeah, of course it is. It was hard. It was so hard. But he's through it now. So as Wayne Bennett said to me, he goes, mate. He goes, you got to get back to doing what you're doing, mate. He goes, Triple M uh, and SCA. It is great for a person like you because they let mm. you be who you are. You have fun. You yeah. know, you know your stuff. You know how to call football. But also, we we build a good good camaraderie here. Um, you know, whether you're you know Barb on the front desk or whether you're the mm. big boss here or whether you're one of the young girls working here, we're, we're a great family. You know that. Yeah. So you are a part of the Rush Hour team. It's a Sydney Drive show, and it's it's a lot of rugby league chat, but with um. With Gus Warland, who has a big interest in mental health, he's done a documentary series, runs his own charity. There's a there's a deeper thread to the show, isn't there? Oh, there is. But between us, we've got five daughters between us. You know, mm. Drew Bolton's got two, Gus has got two. Obviously, I got one. Mm. So we're all fathers, but we've all you know. And obviously, Gus, the Got You for Life stuff, mm. mate. I, I couldn't do it. Neither can Drew. But we have to lift each other, lift each other up sometimes. Like mm. Gus would tell us about something that just happened with a young country girl or a country mm. boy that he's got to wear. So on our show, we, we reset. And Laura Boucher, who's our boss, and um, you know, we reset. And if like when I wasn't on, sometimes they would let me have the day off and replace. But now I've just got to make sure that I'm on because what I've been through um, is, is nothing compared to what some of these. And, and Jude's quite good too because the Swans AFL factor. But we've all been mates for about twenty years. So I, mm. I, I played a cricket match with Gus Wall and. Uh, for Gillies 2020 down at Wollongong, you know, 20 years ago, you know. Does much of this life, deeper life stuff come through in the show? I know it's a lot of jokes, yeah. a lot of football, but does a lot of this oh, stuff yeah. come through on the radio? Of course it does. Like, we, can I just say this? We've had days there where, um, you know, we, we've all cried at different stages, whether it's off, you know, off camera. Um, you know, Gus has gone through something. I've gone through something. Mate, Jude's done it a bit tough, you know, at different times. Uh, and we all do our, the community stuff, but even... Even when, um, you know, uh, yeah, it just, yeah, we, it's just not, it's just not a boy show. It's just not mm. a rush hour. It's just not rush hour talk about sport. Like we all love entertainment. We've all got a story. We all bring each other down. Yeah. We all pull each other in the line. If we think we're out, we're out of line. And, yeah. um, I, I know sometimes when I probably, you know, I've been a little bit selfish and the boys go, mate, like we're a team here, mate. Like we got to work together. You know, there's, it's not a one man show or it's not a two man show. So, and then we get people like Candice Warner who, who, mm. who join us and then, uh, Millie Boyle, you know, Millie Elliott now. So we've got a great rotating sort of cast too with, because Jude, Gus and I have got sponsors outside this um, and, and and it works. And, mm. and to be honest, SCA let us be us and, and we have a good time doing it, you know. Mate, it's so good because finding a career after elite sport can't yeah. be easy. No, that's right. Did you have a plan B? What else would you have done? What if this wasn't happening? I always knew I was going to do something. I always knew I was yeah. going to be a star. <laughs> like, I'm serious. Like, that's why I'm in the Kia because I'm a star. <laughs> but, but I always knew. So can I tell you a funny story? Yeah. When I was 18, 19, the Broncos said to me, oh, look, there's these things called the Black Thunders in yeah. Brisbane. You know, yeah. So you, you know who used to drive me around? Who? Andrew G. Wow. Yeah. So we said the Black Thunders when I was 18. It was the best job. So I knew then working with Zoe Sheridan and- um, So your radio career started when you were 18. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I was out of the game for two years, you asked me what I did. I actually did Cole and Jackie Owen when they were here. I was their sports reporter. So, you know, that's so left to center. For they, them love a, they love a comeback story, don't they? They love a comeback story. <laughs> so, um, and that's what I mean. Like, so now, as Wayne Bennett said to me when I came back, he said, people, mate, they've forgiven you because, you know what, because you've earned your second chance. But he goes, if you keep doing the same same stuff, people won't forgive you. So that's why I know I'm big energy sometimes, but people don't see me want to go home. I just, I just crash. I just mm. sleep. I just turn off my phone. Um, you know, and sometimes I overcommit myself. And then I came in, come into work, and I'm tired. The boys go, "What have you been doing?" I said, "I made did this, did that." And then they sort of say, "May pull back a little bit, mm. just say no to a lot of things." And that's what I've done lately, and I I feel better for it. And yeah, that's the tough balancing act of yeah. an extrovert, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Finding your, you know, find the balance. Yeah, find the balance, balance is key. And you know what Wayne said to me too? He goes, "Last year, he said, and I speak to Wayne every couple of weeks, and you'd love this. The best sledge I've ever had was from Wayne Bennett." Hmm. We do a lot of functions together, Wayne and I. And he said, you know, someone said, what's what's the best thing that uh, you could say about Wendell Saylor? And he goes, to be honest, he goes, there's not much I can say about Wendell Saylor that he hasn't said about himself. <laughs> but he fell in love with himself at the age of thir- he fell in love with himself with- at the age of thirteen, and he's been faithful ever since. <laughs> and mate, to hear Wayne Bennett say that about me, but and- you're owning it because yeah. you know that it's actually healthy. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, that's the thing, and that's that's why I'm in a healthy sort of place because I think healthy some, self love. Yeah, but I think as I said to my daughter, sometimes I said, "Honey, you know what? Um, you got to love yourself before you love love others." And this is why it's good having a daughter. Have you got a daughter or a son? No, two sons. Oh yeah, well, yeah. mate, you want Just a daughter? Started though. But yeah, you you, you got to have a daughter. So, anyway, yeah. so I said to my daughter Matisse, I said, "Honey, you know what they say? You got to love yourself before you love others." She looks at me and she goes, "Don't worry about that, Dad. You got that covered." <laughs> And that's it. She's 21 and she's in my world and she's like, she's my moral compass every day. I think, I think if you have that plus honesty, yeah. that's a great combination. If you love yourself, but you can't be honest, yeah. that's a recipe for disaster. 100%. And that's where I was at different stages in my life, you know, and even the party stuff. I just like being around people. Yeah. And I, think, I get it. You know, and even like, you know, when we used to go to Townsville, I used to pack my going out clothes first. I used to pack a couple of different outfits because I knew we were going to the Mad Cow or Bullwinkles and that. You had some pretty good shirts in those days. Unbelievable. Some bright stuff. Yeah, bright stuff. <laughs> and then also, I was one of the first guys who started wearing sleeveless shirts and people people walk, out, yeah. people walk out and go, mate, this bloke, how much does he love himself? <laughs> <laughs> well, as we're finding out, that's a good thing. Wendell, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, Tom, big fan, mate. Thank you very much. On you, mate. Thank you. Cheers, mate. That was great. Nah, too easy, mate. Yeah, I love the idea. Hey, that was another episode of The Weekend Briefing. I really hope you liked it. If you did, um, please um, like this video, drop us a comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more of these big interviews with the humans behind the headlines.